You can do okay. it. Okay. Put the music on. Hello, so. everybody. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to celebrate the release of Freddie Moore's memoir. Um, we're joined by Shannon, who is the amazing author who helped Freddie tell his story on paper, his wife, Renee, and Kevin Newton, who has been a longtime, lifelong Cats fan, one of the originals, and also has known Freddie since forever. Um, we'll be doing a giveaway. So the first five people to buy their books from the link below will get um, a free tote bag, which you can see behind Shannon there. Um, and if you guys have any questions throughout the talk, feel free to throw those questions in the ask a question box and Shannon, Renee and Kevin will try to get to those as best they can. So everybody have a good time and yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Hi, you guys. So Shannon, are you going to start? I'm going to start. I okay. am so excited to be here, everyone. Thank you so much. We have 95 people here for Rick and Freddie and Scott. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for being here and for supporting oh, for the love him. Of Freddie. For, yes. For, for, for being interested in him. If you don't know about him already, we're excited to tell you about him. Um, such an important person that not everybody knows about and everybody should know about him. Um, so he goes by three names, Rick, Freddie, and Scogie. Depending on when you knew him, um it it matters and there's a whole chapter in the book about that and his his different names i thought i would talk a little bit about writing the book um with him and i just think that it was such a, a journey for me personally and i thought it might be interesting for everyone to to know kind of the process of, of how the book was written between the two of us um if i had to describe rick in like two words i would say he's serious fun like he has this very serious component to him where it's like music, music, music on task. And everyone who knows him, I'm sure is like nodding their head. Um, right. But he knew how to have such a good time too. And we had a blast writing this book, I have to tell you. Um, I had written one memoir before meeting Renee and Rick um, for Manhood Parkinson's. And I'd taken a creative writing workshop in LA and the, the person who ran that workshop recommended me to Renee when Renee reached out to her on to find somebody who could help someone with a health challenge write their memoir. So the moment I met these two, it was at Aroma Cafe, if you're familiar with LA, it's off of Ventura Boulevard. And the sun was shining, birds were chirping, and we just, <laughs> right, Renee? Like we just vibed, like we just, it just like, it just was. It just was a magical moment from the very right. beginning. I loved him. Um, and so how we wrote it was we would meet twice a week online on Skype. And then I would usually go down, um, I live up in Santa Clarita, which is about an hour from where Rick and Renee lived. And um, I'd go down like once a week and talk to them in person. And then twice a week, I would interview him on Skype and we spent hours and hours together. I'd always start with music because that was would always be like what would get him going and get him remembering things. Um, so I always started our sessions with music. Um, and you know those musicians that they don't just sing or play, but they are the song and they are the voice. Like that was, that's him. He. He embodies music. Um, and I was just always so impressed with that. Like it came from his soul. It didn't just, wasn't just like a performance. Um, so he had actually written some of the scenes already. Um, like there's a, a section in the book called The Tent. And that was one of his favorites um, that he really wanted. He actually wanted that to lead the book. And we ended up doing uh, Legend of Madame Wong to lead the book. But The Tent is in there. And it was this funny story about him in a tent. <laughs> when he was a kid and he actually had that section written out and he had some other sections in there too but i had to interview a lot of people a lot of people on this call right now have helped make this book happen because his memories were very scattered um he'd be talking about when he was five one minute and then when he was 45 the next minute in different periods of time so it was a challenge to sort of you know, get all that information and put it together in a cohesive way. He was extremely adamant it would not be a chronological, boring memoir, like autobiography. He wanted it to be unique. Um, and I think we accomplished that um, by, by kind of categorizing the book into chapters that are more like short stories surrounding his songs, which were the most important things to him, besides Renee. <laughs> um, I think we actually accomplished that. Um, one of my favorite stories was his birth story. And I did take a little bit of creative license in that story. Just little things like what would his mom may have been wearing. It was so much fun for me to research like 
maternity fashion in that time in 1950 in Minnesota, like what did women wear? And so she's wearing like a mustard yellow swing dress. That is creative license, but everything else is what he, as he told it to me. And um, hopefully we got, you know, the spirit of everything right. Even if we got some details wrong here and there, it was just his memory that, um, you know, wasn't perfect at the time. And my favorite story though, in the book is the first chapter um, that I wrote. And it was my, it's my favorite because I feel like it really captures the time period in LA the, of the cats, which is the tank top I'm wearing, because it's 80 degrees in LA, by the way. So that's <laughs> um, and it it was written in a creative a memoir writing workshop I was taking, and with the amazing instructor Monica Holloway, who wrote a book called Driving with Dead People. It's a memoir. It's fantastic. She was doing this memoir workshop, and I was trying to like get my craft, you know. And it was a free write. It was like spend 15 minutes writing and I just like sat down and boom. And that's like exactly how that chapter is. It just was like, just, it almost flowed out of me like songs flew with through Rick. And that was like the moment that I really like connected my soul to his and was able to embody him in a way. Um, so I love that chapter. Um, I loved that the fans were so intense. They were throwing cat food at the stage and I just, the, the energy of it, the fact that Madame Wong is this like legendary godmother of punk who like hated everyone except for like Rick. She like screamed at the Ramones, but like loved Rick and wanted him to come play all the time. Um, some of my other little favorite stories, I love how in Minnesota, when they were recording some of their first uh, songs on two records, um, they had a producer who was Bob Dylan's brother and Bob Dylan's brother said, my brother has a song. Do you want to use it? This is Bob Dylan now. And Rick's like, nah, I've got my own songs. And I just think that was like, like, so amazing. Who does that? <laughs> Who does that? Who says, no, I don't want Bob Dylan's song. I've got my own. <laughs> um, and there was just so many. I did so much research. I mean, he kept everything. He had calendars from every single day for years. And I would pour through them. Like what he did every single day was like written down, taking the dog to the groomer, like everything was written down in detail, <laughs> the gigs, the practice sessions, the photo shoots. It was such a filled calendar. I had so much material to work with thanks to his ability to keep everything. Um, and he, I remember reading one um, entry and I was like, what? It was just a pencil scribbling of a phone number and it said Danny Elfman under it. And I was like, Danny Elfman, like it was his phone number. So of course I immediately like called it, but it, you know, nobody answered. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like, it shows you his, his, he was so prolific in his time. He was, him and Sting made out, like he was, they opened for, uh, uh, for the police, their first, their first um, trip here to the US and he's so profound and yet the mass market doesn't know about him. Um, and it was a journey to get it published. I think it was about seven years from the time we started. It took us, I think about three years to get it all done. Um, a lot of people contributed to that. And for that, we are so grateful. I know a lot of you are here tonight um, and we finally found the right publisher and the right moment and it's here and we're so proud of it. Um, definitely was hard as a sensitive person as I am to go through this journey with him. Alzheimer's is no joke. I've never experienced anything like it. Um, I'm really happy that Renee's very active in the Alzheimer's community because I think there's a lot of understanding that needs to happen on what it's like, but we started out pretty strong. His memory was really solid, but of course, as time went by, there were moments that he would you know, tell me that he was needed, couldn't hear me. So he would turn on the light, you know, and just these miss, this, these miscommunications or he would go get a snack and not come back. And I'd be yelling through the camera, like, Rick, where are you? Come back to the, come back. And I'd be screaming. It, it's, he would come back and we would laugh about it. Like I, we laughed probably 90% of the time. And then the other 10% of the time, there were those really deep emotional moments where we would cry together. Um, when we would read the chapters as they were done, we would cry together. It was a really family, like just really close, close relationship. And um, I think it comes through, I hope it comes through in the book. It does. Um, I was so in awe of you, Renee, and your tireless efforts to help keep his memory alive. I think that working on the book and all the supplements and all the work you did really helped him continue being able to work on it as long as he was able to. Um, and I think that it's so beautiful. And I think the main thing is when I asked him, what was, what's the point of his life? You know, what's the, what was the meaning of your life? And he said, because I got to be in love with Renee is what he told me. 
and it's gonna make me cry th through, throughout it all and we, there's an ending in the book i won't i won't spoil for those of you who haven't read it yet but i hope that what comes across is that love conquers all and love lasts no matter what what memory someone has or doesn't have the feeling of love lasts and to have love is the meaning of life and that's kind of what the whole point of the book was and in brick's eyes and i'm just communicating that to you because that's what he would want to communicate to you and he communicated that to you through me so um let me see what else do i want to get over get get out um <laughs> he never wanted fame um he could have had it easily. Um, I do hope that this book reaches a lot of hearts though, because he's just, he's just so inspiring and so fantastic. Um, and I thought I would show you a little video because this is what it was like writing the book. Um, this is a 30 second video and this is me inside Rick and Renee's place. And he's trying to teach me guitar, <laughs> which I did not know had anything about. <laughs> and they give me a guitar and he said, was an amazing teacher. He was an amazing teacher and he taught me a couple a quarter two. It was his first song he ever wrote called Baby Be Mine. And he was like 13 years old when he wrote it. And he's trying to teach it to me. And I'm dropping the pick inside the guitar and it's chaos and we're laughing. And he's dancing around the room and it's 30 seconds. And I just thought that fans of Rick would probably enjoy it. this. Is the only way I can share it with you is to do this. There he is. <laughs> There's me. So cute. I dropped the pig. <laughs> and he just keeps going. He's a pro. That's it. Um, that was what it's like writing the book. Um, and I guess I'll go check for some questions here. Let's see. Yeah, there's four um, questions. What's that, Kevin? There's four questions. All right. Um, what inspired Freddie to write the book? Um, Renee, do you want to take that one? Because you the inspiration to write the book came before I came along. Yeah. Um, he was home, you know, he was, he was retired. So he was home and he started posting stories of his life on Facebook and he decided, you know, I'm just going to keep posting these stories on Facebook. And, and then I said, well, wait a minute, maybe you should, you know, we should write, you should write a book. And he said, I would love to write a book, but I don't know how to go about it or what to do. And so we contacted Ron Manis, who was, uh, he's the head of, he was the head of Alfred Music Publishing at the time. And um, we went to the NAM show, which I'd never been, which was very cool. I, I know musicians don't know, but it's like a, it's like the CS Consumer Electronics Show for Musicians. It's all kinds of cool equipment. And we got to meet a bunch of people there and we talked to Ron Manis about maybe doing the book. And then we realized it was going to be too hard to pull the stories out of Rick. So um, we just decided, I decided to call the LA Writers Group and find a bunch of writers to interview. And he really clicked with Shannon and that's how it came about. And I just really wanted to preserve his memories and his life because it was an amazing life it just has so much depth and adventure and cool stuff and i'd wanted him to be able to remember that and i think the process of writing the book actually helped him with the alzheimer's with the memory stuff because having to recall all these things was helpful to him he was actually improving a little bit when he was remembering all this stuff. He's like forcing himself to, to think about it and to do it. And I think it really helped for a while. I think it really did. And in addition to all the stuff I was putting him through, but <laughs> I was determined to fix him. <laughs> um, but um, I think it really helped. And that's that was the whole thing about doing the book. And if Rick were in his right mind, I'm sorry to say that, but if he were, he would kill me for how much money I have put into this book. <laughs> he would say, no way you're not doing this. This is a vanity project. <laughs> and I'm like, we're doing it. We are doing it. And when I mean something, I mean it and I don't stop. So I was determined to fix him and I was determined to write this book. And this book is a huge achievement for us. And we did it. And I it think is. it's amazing. Yes, it's an amazing <laughs> story. And I love it. I love, there's so much to it. Even LA is a character in this book. Yeah. It's really you know? more, more than just a music story. It's so family. It's, it's great love, fun. LA, so, it's, 
Um, I just loved it. I, I love the book. I think it's so much fun. And all the pictures. And he saved everything. I used to bitch at him all the time about, why are you such a hoarder? And he would yell at me, I like to save everything. And he's a collector. As you can see, the wall of CDs. Well, you can't. But there's a wall of CDs behind me. But, um, yeah, he saved everything. And thank God he did. Because, man, we had a lot of material. We used all of it. I mean, I wish, yeah, there's more pictures at some point we'll hopefully roll those out like on the website or something there's definitely yes. way more material um, than we can thank you book. jamie for putting out all of this stuff in. we have like extra extra pictures in here thanks to the publisher we but, had a hundred pictures or over a hundred pictures yeah. to put in the book we only put we were only allowed to put a little bit so um, um renee there's a question for you is that gresh guitar behind you his original guitar from yes it guitar? is yes it is that is his <laughs> original gresh and the one next to it, which you can't see, but I'll move the camera, is his Gibson that he played on stage with the cats all the time. Many times, many times. Yes. So, of course, we have those. <laughs> Fantastic. Cool. Yes. Fabiana was asking what was the most difficult part of the book. I think I sort of, I, for me, I sort of covered it, I think. And I think Renee would probably agree it was. The most difficult part of the book was watching his memories fade. Watching him disintegrate is the hardest part of this whole story. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You never know what you're going to get. It was a very unpredictable process. One day would be like, I text Renee. He was on. We got on everything. Fire. Yeah. The next, it was would be like, the next day, to tell you, we had nothing. Like we just. Yeah. And somebody who it. loved their brain as much as him, mm -hmm. for him to lose his brain is the worst thing that could ever happen because he loved his brain and he was so smart and so brilliant and he loved to fill it with knowledge and now he can't. Yeah, for so. someone who like he couldn't work Skype at the end and he wrote his own tax program before TurboTax right. was, was a thing. Right. So, you know, yeah, to watch that happen was absolutely the hardest part um, of it. But I'm really glad that's a gift that we did get it down when we did. Yeah. Um, and then Linda asked, Renee, when did you know that you had to tell the world this amazing story? I think we kind of covered that in the. Um, you know, I started noticing that he was forgetting things and being forgetful. And the problem was that um, he was he had an amazing memory. I, as you as it says in the book, he had like an identic memory. He could remember everything. And for him to get lost and not know where the car was, that was the part that was so odd for me because he knew everything and um so i knew that we had to start documenting every story that he did remember before it was all gone so that was that was why we wrote this book and and it's such an amazing story so many things to it so many layers so yeah, yeah. and then this is another one for you renee so much of this book is about the experience of true love that was so beautifully captured, thank you. Can you all, especially Renee, the love of his life, speak to how love motivated Rick's amazingly creative spirit? Rick was so deep. I loved that about him. And we were on the same page from the beginning. We just were soulmates for real. I mean, just- I can vouch for that. <laughs> I mean, we, could, we had our own language. I mean, it was like, it was weird. I mean, we just had our own language. We talked about it. everything. We could talk for hours. We loved each other. I don't, people used to say, it's, this is weird that you guys are so much in love. This is weird. This doesn't happen every day. And I'm like, we're just lucky that we found each other. And he's the only one, you know, he's just the one. He's the one. He's my big one too. Yeah. The song big one is about you guys, right? Yep. yep. I can't listen to the song he wrote called My Renee. I cannot. I will just Have cry and cry song? and cry. Wait, 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 wait. Have I heard that song? No, nobody's heard that song. What? Nope. Oh my God. That's so special. <laughs> it's just so, yours. Yeah. It's wow. it's true. I mean, it I fought like hell for this relationship because I knew it was right. And I went against my family. I went against everybody. He was way too old for me. And everybody said, you know, don't do it. But I, nobody could talk me out of it. He was the one. He is the one. Even and to this day, he 30 years. says, I love you. I, he says, I love you. 
I have to say it first, but he does say it. (laughs) It's about all he can say, right? I mean, I mean, how beautiful is that? That's what I'm talking about, that love is is everlasting. And I feel it. I feel it when he sees me. He knows me. He knows me, even though he doesn't know a lot of things, but he knows me. Okay, should we let Kevin talk now? Uh, Am I frozen for you guys? Am I okay? No, you're good. Okay. Maybe it's just for me. Maybe I'll refresh or I can't see Kevin moving. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Kevin! Hello, Looks like, hey, we, got, we, we have 103 people online. Yeah, baby. Get out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. So I want to say thank you, everybody. That's, that's, yes. pretty, damn, that's pretty damn cool. So, well, thank yeah. you for, for everybody loving Rick and what this is all about. So, well, I want to go way back to a galaxy a long time ago <laughs> called Hollywood. Um, I want to talk, I, I want to just talk about the first night that I saw the cats and Rick and how it basically just changed my life. Um, As you guys, as Renee and Shannon know, uh, the story goes that I went to see a completely different band that night. Uh, A friend of mine was raving about this band called The Heaters, and I'm sure a lot of you guys from way back then may remember them, The Heaters, they used to play LA all the time. So he's raving about this local band called The Heaters, and I'm a very naive 17 year old, but I really loved music at the time anyway. So I'm like, these bands cannot be any good because they're playing these clubs and they're not signed and blah, 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 right? He's like, you're an idiot because that's how they get signed is playing these clubs and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right. So I go see the heaters at the Troubadour and they are the opening act for this other band called The Cats, which I'd never heard of them either, right? So the heaters start and they are fantastic. They were really great. I was really impressed with this band called The Heaters. So I'm there with my buddy. And we're like, oh, they were really good. You want to stick around and you know see the next band? He's like, yeah, all right, we'll stick around. We'll stay, stay for the next band. Now, if that decision had been something completely different, if we had gone home that night, my life, I wouldn't be here. You guys would be talking to somebody else. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> so anyway, we stayed to see the cats. And from the opening song, I knew that this was something special. I knew that these guys were going to be What was the opening huge. song? The first song was called Give Me a Chance, which is, you know, perfect. You know. How does it go? Give me a chance. I'm not going to sing it. You're not going to get me to sing it. I can remember it, but I'm not going to sing it. You know, if you, if you want to end this cast, you start me. To, you have me sing. Anyway. So they play this song, and then the next song, and the next song, and the next song. And, and literally by the end of this set, I'm like, I'm hooked. I'm, I'm going to see these guys as much as I possibly can, right? And I did. For the next few weeks, I went to see them, uh, you know, almost every other night they were playing, whether it's Madame Wong, the Troubadour, you know, the Whiskey, all these other clubs, right? that were, you know, uh, back uh, around then that are no more, except for, you know, Troubadour and the Whiskey. Anyway, um, so one night they're playing the Whiskey, and I go and see them, and, and at this time, I you know, there's the groupies and the friends, and everybody's hanging around, I'm starting to, you know, to meet all these different people and stuff like that, and, and one of them is uh, Emily, who's no longer with us, sad to say, but she's like, you want to go, you want to meet them? You want to go backstage and meet them? I'm like, of course, I'm going to meet these guys. These, are, these guys are fantastic. And long story short, I go backstage, I meet all the guys, and Rick and I just start talking. And just like you guys are saying, when you meet this guy, it's like instantaneous. There is something about him where you are just automatically, this guy's really cool. I like this guy. Because you would think the lead singer of this band, like he might be off, you know, kind of cold or off-putting or anything like that. He was so amiable to me. And to put it in a whole nother way, even racially speaking, I'm the only black guy around. I had a huge afro at the time. You know, and these guys are all from Minneapolis, and they started treating me like I was like their little brother or something, all five of these guys. But Rick and I became really close pretty quickly, and I think he started recognizing me in the audience. So when I met him backstage at the Whiskey, he kind of already, oh, yeah, you're the, I've seen you out in the, in, the, in the thing there. So long story short, again, little by little, I kept showing up at the gigs, and I, you know, I'm learning all the songs, and I'm hanging out backstage, and Rick and I are becoming friends, and I'm becoming friends with all the bands, and Next thing I know, I'm doing the light show and I'm doing the MC and I'm, I'm, I'm writing the newsletter with Rick and hanging out, you know, after gigs and going to, uh, you know, other clubs with him. And he's introducing me to all these different types of music and all these other different bands and stuff. And not only that, we started going to revival theaters. He's introducing me to old, old movies that I've never heard of and stuff like that. So we became like brothers. It was like he became my big brother. And from that on, from that night on, it was just like. The most exciting time of my life and i'll never forget it for like that night on for like the next five or six years and but but getting back to rick personally he was just and is just one of the best people i've ever known in my life he's just funny amiable uh intelligent outgoing uh inclusive uh you know he was like the pied piper for everyone he just 
you know, you meet the guy and you just want to be around him all the time. And it seemed like everybody felt that way. I have to so, vouch. I mean, I probably spoke to about a hundred people. Yeah. And not one person who could have said something negative did. Right. Um, he had that effect on everyone. And I know that in the Skogie days, probably Wingo and Mark Escher, and th those are the guys that that was your role back in the Skogie days, too. And I know Wingo's here, too. So hi, Wingo. Hi, Wingo. Um, and, and I think he had that effect on everyone. They either inspired them or made them better or was inspirational to them. Um, he just had such an amazing... Just... There's not a musician that didn't see that band or didn't see him and didn't want to meet him or get to know him or hang out with him. Uh, it was incredible. I mean, every club, he got into every club because every time he walked in, oh, yeah, come on in. You know, it's like everybody knew who he was, and but he never had a rock store attitude at all. You know, he was never... I mean, he could have easily, you know, had a big ego no, he and an attitude. Never drank or smoked. Like he never, never drank or smoked. I mean, I, I had a friend of mine come over, came over today. A friend of mine came over today who had never heard of him and the band and everything like that. And I played the video I made for him and I played the Lost My TV Guide video and she became an instant fan. I mean, just like that. She became an instant fan of the band, you know, and she yeah. was like, oh, I would have loved these guys back in the day. I'm like, absolutely. Everybody did. You know? Yeah, Betsy just added gentle to the list of his traits. Yeah, I mean, I was there the night that they they opened for the police at the whiskey. It was in, it was insane because the police were there for three straight nights, and they opened for the for the, uh, the the police three straight nights. And Sting was crazy about these guys. I mean, he, I mean, he would just you know grab Rick almost after every gig. It was just like it was. <laughs> I know, know Rick said, "Why he kiss me on the lips?" And I'm yeah, like, "What?" Right, yeah, but that's the thing about like you're saying that like, he could have been a star. It, it, but it's like I was telling my friend Tammy today about well. Yeah, he could have been a star if he had sold all of his tunes or if he'd given he up his rights. And it's like, that's it not going to happen. And it's it like, that's place. all he had was these. And that's another thing about Rick, which just blew me away, was that how prolific he was as a songwriter. It's like, how many great songs can this guy write? A thousand songs he wrote. You know, and I, and I think one of the things that Rick appreciated about me was like, I wasn't like a fawning kind of fan. I mean, I, you know, I was like, uh, you know, I had my critiques about different things and stuff like that. And I had my own attitude but i wasn't like somebody that if i didn't like a song or something like that i would tell him i mean there was a couple of songs i was like oh i just don't get it but then even those two songs i didn't get after two or three or four or five gigs it was like oh yeah that is a great song i just wasn't getting it now i get it okay all right i get it now okay all right you know okay so, I, have a question. I have a question for both of you well shannon you kind of know this from after but what is your favorite band from listening oh. to all the stuff I got, it has to be, it has to be the, I mean, cause I'm an eighties girl. So I did, I missed, I was just on the cusp. I missed, I missed him. I never got to see him live. That's why all the videos are so important to me. I, I wanted to be there so badly, but yeah, I think it's the cats, um, was my favorite. And yeah. just because it's, yeah, modern modern is the best. Years, I to think maybe that's the best. Modern. And when they're formative years, they connect with music. That's the, their favorite. Like when you're 15, 14, like the music you connect with at that age is like what yeah. builds you. And so that's what I, that's kind of my generation. No, and as you said in the book, Rick would say boy was his most um, accomplished. Accomplished, yeah. Um, the writing. The tightest writing or the. the I still yeah. think, I mean, that was, was a tight one, boy. boy. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I, I always that's felt when me. I, when that's I. Uh -huh. yeah, that's when yeah. yeah, when I saw when I saw the cats, the, the, I knew every time I saw them, it's like these guys are going to be stadium big because they were they they were they had the show spontaneous and, you know, uh, 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 not pro, you know, not planned, but they would have their kind of things that they kind of came up with, you know, during the live acts. But when I, I just knew that they could play any stadium, they could play a stadium, they could play a small club, they could play anywhere. They were that good and that powerful, especially with Pete you know, on the guitar there, just really freeing up Freddie to be the, the, to be the showman that he really was. Cause he was, a, he, he was an amazing showman. I mean, not only was he a fantastic singer, but his presence on stage was incredible. He was so relaxed, but, you know, diving into the audience, I mean, interacting with people. I mean, he just, he brought you to the stage. I mean, you know, with all that showmanship. So with Pete on the guitar and everybody else, backing up it really freed him off from playing rhythm guitar on every song you know so it really made him the ultimate showman that could do everything on stage so it was really right. wonderful so that for me that was my favorite uh group but boy next door was like i thought was like the evolution of the cats how they would have gone to like having the horn section things like that you know 
So yeah, Boy Next Door was absolutely fantastic. I mean, those gigs at Chinatown and Wong's West, I mean, they just tore the place apart, you know. But, but they always did, you know, every gig. They, they just right. tore the place apart every gig. It was incredible. I, I mean, I told Renee and Shannon, I must have seen them 200 times over, you know, two or three years or something like that. You know? I'm putting a link to uh, exactly what he's talking about in the chat. It's uh, it's a video from oh, a yeah. show back in All the 80s called Hollywood Heartbeat. And now, here's a great a story about that. And uh, you can we, you know, this is, this is, yeah, yeah this yeah. is back, you know, in the, in the Neanderthal days when there's no, you know, uh you know facebook or anything like that so yeah so we you know they, they yeah they did the taping for the show and then it was going to be on for it was two weeks out it was going to be on on a friday night so uh we gathered that the only person that we knew that had a vcr at the time so we gathered at that person's house to watch the to watch the broadcast and it was live you know for us watching it live it was just so amazing because we thought this was the beginning of you know the big deal they're on tv now and it's lost my tv guide their big hit single and Right. You know, and yeah, and like you said, Ken and Shannon about how the, the girls used to, the groupies and the girls and the friends and the fans used to show up. At, and, and during Lost My TV Guide, exactly, they would throw TV guides on the stage as well during the song. So I it was still really work out to that music. I play, like I said, <laughs> I, I dance around that. my living room with to that song all the time. I played that for a friend of mine today, and she's like, this is great. These guys would have been, I would have loved these guys. But people don't know what a TV guide is. Yeah, that's right it. <laughs> Look at Bobby's yo going at it. Oh, it's yeah. so much fun. I do this whole thing too when I'm doing it. I do CO2. I do Busy Body. I do King of the Wild Frontier. I do all of the moves. <laughs> and there's Pete, and he Pete's just chiming in. He saw Skogie the cover band in a bar in Santa Monica long before they met. Wow. He was all over the stage wow. playing guitar. So yep. Pete That's so is, cool. in, is, is yeah. here. Well, I don't know. How can I point Pete to McCray. Pete? Very really great guy. Anyway, and that's what I say. And, I, and, also video, this... and he's he actually saw because when they first moved to LA, they did a cover band for their feet. Yeah, always feet. with the hat. Always with the hat. Um, but I also I, I want to say that all the guys in the band were like like I said, they became all of them became like big brothers to me. They were all fantastic. But you know, it was like not only were they just fantastic musicians, but they were great friends. They were great guys just to hang out with, and they were always cool and nice. And there was no drugs and there was no drinking, and it was just. <laughs> It was all about the music, and that was so great about it. And when they invited me to the studio, when when Rick said, "Hey, you want to come down to the studio? We're, we're recording my album," I was like, my head just kind of went, "Wait a minute, what's going on here?" Because I'm not a musician; I'm just a fan. Why is he being so friendly to me? It's like, what's going on here? And I still, to this day, try to figure out why Rick and I became so close. You know, we 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 seem to be not polar opposites, but we came from two completely different worlds. It seemed like. But we became close like brothers. I mean, we became roommates. And I mean, it's like, you know, he when he signed his album to me, he's like, uh, he's like you are the number one Cats fan and my confidant. <laughs> you know why, Kevin? Because you're an artist. And he had a bond with artists. He had yeah. a connection with anyone who was an artist and anyone who was he, passionate about their work. He made me draw this. Uh, cool. That McBeef Hardwood. Hardwood. Yeah. Um, he made me elephant. draw that from the from the beef hardwood thing. He also, yes. and I don't know, Renee, if you can find that song. You know, remember he made me sing a song that we recorded. Really? Yeah, so long to the sunshine. Remember? I do. I'm gonna find that song. You gotta find that. Yeah, I will. It, was, it was the strangest thing. This is when <laughs> Rick and I were roommates, and I came home from work one day, and him, Denny, and Bobby are in the living room rehearsing, right? And he goes, "I have this song, a new song, but I want you, me, to sing uh -huh. lead on it." <laughs> and I go, Rick, I don't, I can't sing. I've never sung. And he's like, it doesn't matter. He goes, I like your voice. He goes, I want you to sing lead on this song. Here's the lyrics. And here it is. Learn it. Right. The next day I come home, same thing is, okay, we're going to record it tonight. And they have the, the four track thing and him, me, Denny and, and Bobby sitting there. And I learned the song and I start singing the song. He goes, no, 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 stop. He goes, I want you to sing it with a Jamaican accent. Because it's a great <laughs> I go, I didn't know that. What story. are you doing to me? I don't sing. You want to think of the reggae accent? He goes, just do it, right? So you got to find it. So I start singing, and I don't know what's going on here. But then when he joined me on the chorus, the sound of my voice with him was perfect. Wow. He knew so that. When you he find it, when you that. find That's it, I sound, I sound like a bull moose trapped in the tar pits by myself. Right? <laughs> But when Rick comes in on the harmony with me, oh, his voice. we sound perfect. Wow. And that's what I went, wow. now I understand why he wanted me to sing it. So yeah, you gotta find it. I, I, I haven't heard it in years, but it's called So Long to the Sunshine. 
I'm writing and it down. We made a we made a recording of it. I'll find it. <laughs> I find but stuff. That's, but that's what I mean about Rick. He would he would he would he would uh, ask me or tell me to do things that I couldn't that I never knew that I could do. That, be the MC, the run the light show, do. draw stuff, uh, sing. He would just be like, "You can do it." That's a thing. Yeah. There's there was multiple artists and musicians I spoke with in my in my interviews that said the exact same thing. I didn't think I could do it until Rick showed me I could do it. Yeah. Same thing yeah. with me. And you too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know we're gushing about the guy, but it's all true. It's all completely true. It's all true. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't. We never. Gentle soul. He's still a gentle soul, yeah. uh, as attested by uh, Stephanie. Stephanie just asked, said that she he was a gentle soul. He dances Maggie around, you know, where he is now. He just twirls her. <laughs> I mean, like I said, I had the, the greatest time of my life with these guys and Rick in particular, because like I said, we became roommates and best friends. And I just, you know, I think about it now. I just, I wonder why, but it just, it just was meant to be. It's just you're friends with people and your family with people that you are just meant to be with. And it was just the best time of my life. It was so exciting running around right. seeing all these other bands, the bus boys and Mick Smiley and you know the naughty Love sweeties. It. Love it. Incredible. It was just absolutely incredible. And Rick being like I said, the greatest Pied Piper that any young man, you know, or young group of people could have was just incredible. Yeah. Um, there are a couple more questions. Um from Sarah. Did Rick feel he was changing because of the disease? And I can definitely talk about this. Um, he definitely did. He knew exactly what was going on um, for, I would say, most of the time that we were writing together for the like couple years we were writing together. Um, he, most of the time we would laugh, right? But there was that point of time where he would get really frustrated and he knew that there was like memories and something important he wanted in his brain that he could not get. And he would put his hands on his head and he would get so frustrated and he'd just be like, ah. Oh. And then one moment, and this is why the epilogue um, in the book is called, he said, my brain is half open. I can't get to the other half. And he would, it would just frustrate him so much. And he would apologize constantly to Renee. I'm so sorry that you're going through this. I'm so sorry this is happening. And that was kind of like the, the more emotional side of things. Um, he definitely was aware. Um, I don't think so much now, but um, I think he just generally has like a happy countenance now, but in that period of time, there was like a, probably two or three years, maybe longer, where he knew what was happening and it was frustrating to him. But most of the time, he had such an amazing sense of humor about it that he would laugh um, and we would laugh about it. But yeah, definitely. He used to say all the time, the reason why he didn't get high or he didn't drink is because he was high on life. And he just loved everything, loved learning, loved just every experience. I mean, he just, he made me love it too. And and him, he was just so much fun. But there's so many people that are uneducated about dementia and about Alzheimer's, and they really have no idea what this does to the person's brain. And it's really sad to me. It's the worst disease ever because with cancer, you kind of know what you're fighting. You can have chemo, you can do something about it with this. There's nothing you can do about it, you know, and you just, you watch the person just fade away and it's the worst. And, people don't know anything i mean it's because it's different for everybody the brain is so complex that everyone experiences alzheimer's or dementia in different ways there's there's some people that are you know kind of lucid at times and they have lucid moments and then there's other people that turn into a two-year-old kid i mean there's just so many different things about it and um yeah, it's it's uh, get an education when you live with someone with this, and he has a whole family history of it, and his older brother Doug, and his mom, and his grandmother, and everyone has this disease in his family. Not everyone, but a lot of his relatives. And um, you know, I tr I got him genetically tested. He has two copies of that gene. So thank you, Ginny and Bob or Robert. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's something I want to do more about talking to people about. And I'm, I've signed up for some podcasts to talk about this and talk about dementia. Not that I'm an expert or anything, but I did go through a lot of this with him and I know a lot about it now. So yeah, they did a lot of things like from cryotherapy to 
every experimental thing i made him go into an ox bariatric chamber oxygen chamber he was hating me because he was like i'm claustrophobic i mean don't you know how he was he's total hypochondriac right so if i would have a cold he'd be like don't give it to me don't give it to me <laughs> and he would be like get away from me i don't want to get sick but um it was funny you know we just laughed about it <laughs> i was just All looking that at the uh the chats here people are bringing Isn't it up some, fun? some of the old bands the psychotic pineapple yeah like, they, oh that's right i mixed up the bands i'm sorry they were you the psychotic the pineapple they were the they were terrible but they, they were <laughs> great <laughs> they were terrible but they were great they were terrible but i just remember that one song do you remember the song i want to get rid of you yes yeah <laughs> I want to, want to, want to get rid of you. I want to, want to, want to, want to, want to get rid of you. Got a great story about the naughty sweetie. One night, we were, uh, the naughty sweeties and the cats played together all the time as Pete and everybody else that from back there knows. And Pete probably remembers this, but I think it was at the Golden Bear uh, Club. I think it was Huntington Beach or something like that. So the cats decided to do part of one of the naughty sweetie songs to open one of their own songs. So the Naughty Sweeties had a hit song called Alice. And I think it was Alice. Pete, you could probably help me remember this. But I think it was Alice. So they started off doing the first few bars of Alice and then kicked into their own song. And everybody that was there to see the Naughty Sweeties was like, <gasps> like they're going to do, they're going to do the Sweetie song. And the Sweeties were all going, totally... what the hell are they going to do our song? You know, but it was like, you know, it was a friendly rivalry with the Naughty Sweeties. They had the same managers at one point. So, oh, that's interesting. But yeah, there was there was a lot of bands, the Bus Boys, Mick Smiley. I mean, I'm seeing Bates Motel, Motels. I mean, we, I mean, the Cats. I mean, the New Cats and the Cats. They played with or for or opened or they all these other bands opened for them. And yeah, it was just like I said. Rick took me to all these clubs, and I saw all, all these bands, the Rubber City Rebels, and God, I mean, it's just it's incredible. And but uh, but even like the bigger like some of the bigger bands we went to see like the specials and cindy lopper we saw cindy lopper in this band called blue angel i mean that was the band she was in before she became solo and she just blew our minds you know so but yeah, it was just amazing Van Halen time. at the rock corporation yeah, it was just Van an Halen. amazing and there was clubs everywhere i mean that's the thing about back then yeah. uh that the bands could make a living it wasn't they weren't being they didn't have to pay to play they were being paid mm -hmm. to you know to pay to play and there was, yeah, the Scooters, Urban Action. I forgot about Urban Action. Yeah, Urban I loved Action. Urban Action. We went to see them all the time. Yeah, yeah. Warren West. Yeah. Yep. I yep. love yep. The, the story of when they were at the punk bar, though, in, in Orange County. It was called, like, the something, the cow, uh, the, the, I forget the name of the bar, but it was, like, the big punk bar. And the cats were playing, and they were just, like, hucking stuff at Denny. And like they were like not like oh. it was like a punk bar and they're slamming bodies, you know, mosh yeah. style. And there's like Rick and doing his thing. And <laughs> and then I think Denny might have like hit somebody with the bass guitar. I don't know. Uh, I don't story now, that. but yeah, it, was, it probably happened. It probably everywhere, happened. Everywhere, yeah. everywhere. <laughs> I see Larry Lee is here. He probably remembers the uh, the uh, <laughs> the the, uh, the riot, the riot at the Starwood. He was there for that one. Right? No, I was so young. I don't remember. Yeah, that's, what in, the that's in the book. That's in the book. The uh, it's been so long. The, what page? Uh, it's on page <laughs> page two twenty six. Two twenty six. Are you serious? Okay, two you don't know sixty six. Two sixty six. There's a that. story. The story about the riot at the well, Starwood. Super fun. When uh, Larry never remembers this, when uh, Luke beer got snatched out of his mouth by the bouncer, and then yes, yes. Car. Yeah, that was that was an amazing night. <laughs> <laughs> let's see anybody else have any other questions let's see let's see yeah ask away folks um we yep, have probably about two more Haven minutes Hurst. so my rick story mirrors yeah, Rob... yours friends from our first meeting at wong's yep did you guys like that's... wong's east or west better Ooh. they had you know wong's east was like home you know, that was like, that's the original place. I mean, the police even shot their their album, uh, inner liner album cover for one of their albums there. Um, but Wong's East felt like the home place that they played there first and most of all. But Wong's West felt like it was bigger and more open. They had upstairs and downstairs. It, was, it felt more like a playground. You know, it was like uh, you could dance at Wong's West, but you couldn't dance at Wong's East. So, you know, it was more fun, I think, at Wong's. West, but Wong's East was smaller, so it was more intimate kind of right. thing. But 
I mean, I loved him anywhere I saw him, but yeah, it was long. Oh, God, Madam Wong, Jesus, how many nice things? Kevin, they said at the Starwood riot, Larry and I got punched out. Rob Urban said that. Yep. <laughs> um, it, was, it was a riot. It, it turned I know you guys are feeling left out. We're, yeah, you so guys can talk about this for them. And the is where it all started. Hold it, hold it, hold it, <laughs> hold it. Has, I have the one. original. The There's original Stogie and the Flaming Pachucos T-shirt. That's an original. Well, what I what I want to know is from everybody how many people have actually bought the book. Uh, <laughs> I um, have. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don't forget, yeah. you got you got you got your color photos in here. And there's a lot of smoggy time frame in here. I think it's because, you know, Rene is so prolific in his life. And so we're kind of focusing on that era. But in the book, there's a ton about that era and how important it was yeah, to look, him. And how he went to college um, and, and went to music theory and composition in, in, in the university. It's why he became such a prolific songwriter. And he wrote these the book amazing ballads, or um, not ballads, but instrumentals, long instrumentals. Um, and... Yeah, well, he, Zappa was a huge influence on him, and yeah, I, who, I think he, oh, and, completely. Uh, and he, I guess, he met him like three times, but he couldn't like get hey, out. Mark words. Goldstein. He couldn't get out words when he would meet Frank Zappa, his idol. Here's, uh, here's Freddie and Rick. Yeah. yeah so I'm gonna show these while you guys. Here's me and Rick. Back when I had hair. <laughs> he looks like Rick. such a little boy there with those giant glasses. I know. We both had giant glasses back then. It was so funny. But yeah, there's Stogie pictures, Stogie stuff. Like yeah, it's great. I mean, it's you did this so well. I mean, there's baby pictures. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I mean, the book is his whole life. It's definitely we're whole talking, life. Kind of yeah, talking about first, LA because of that his first guitar right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Started in his basement. That, in, that could in be that Dallas. Gretch. Oh, that's the that's the guitar from the book. That's the uh -huh. wow. That could be that Gretch right there. Wow, and he's so just playing music. Gotta buy, yeah. So whoever hasn't bought the book, that's why you have to buy the book. <laughs> It was a really important time period for him. Like he really found his home in music with Skogie. Cats. Which by the way, was his name based on a, a PE shirt that he wore in high school. It just was a previously owned shirt that said Skogie. So there's- That must have been Can Have You right there where he's yeah, in the camera. I mean, the yeah, microphone he would, he, would, somebody. he would always jump into the audience and have people sing the song back to Yes, him. yes. That's I what I mean, he was so- he was, too. Uh, <laughs> he was such he was such an interactive performer. You could not help but keep, you know, watch that band because he would bring you in. You know, everybody yeah. else in the band was fantastic too, but he was definitely the, the I leader. didn't hate those pants. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those pants, man. He wore those I hated pants. those pants. <laughs> he wore those pants to death. All right, here's uh here's a great yeah, shot of the whiskey. Soon, but, um, the motels and the cats. Yes. We have a yeah. couple more questions before we have to wrap it up, but um, here's a question. Um, this book was nothing short of awesome. Thank you. Rick always seemed wise beyond his years. Is there some large scale general message he has for the rest of us? Fight like hell to live your truth and your passion. Whatever you're passionate about, passionate about, you do it. Do it and live it. That's what he did every day. He didn't give a shit what anyone else thought. It was like this is my music this is my song and i'm gonna i'm gonna play it whether you like it or not or whether you don't believe in me or not i believe in me i, believe I don't have that but he did <laughs> i don't need so, bob dylan songs <laughs> who cares about bob dylan i got my own song <laughs> and there's, he a just about, uh, there's a question about uh it says about does anybody remember when guitars got stolen at a gig, so the band painted all their cases pink. I do. That's in the book. That. Hold. Wait, you. That, I do remember that, and it is. It, it is in the book. So yeah, check it out. Hold. No way. Oh my god. <laughs> this is the pink Pepto Bismol guitar case, <laughs> so nobody could run off with it unless they, you know, they would be caught because they would see these pink, this pink case. <laughs> I'm so glad right. I saw that question. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then the other one about Genghis Cohen a few years ago, kind of his last gigs that he did. Yeah. How how did that go? And did he love did he love it towards the end? What? The Genghis, the Genghis Cohen, Cohen gigs. gigs. 
he loved playing at Genghis. He loved it. He was in his element. He was so happy. I was on pins and needles because I'm like, don't forget the words. Don't forget the words. But he was great. <laughs> he he puts it on. He Even now he puts it on. When he needs to turn into Freddie Moore, he does. You know? When yeah, someone the, says things to him. There's you know? a link oh, yeah. You were gonna, you were going to mention that, too. Because the same thing happened about, about his three names. Because I didn't know him as Stogie. When I met him, he was Freddie. And then when we became friends, it was Rick. Yeah. And that's how, family, kind of family. Yeah. And Free Kogi was Rick. Yeah. Yep. So it's like on and stage, he's so Freddie. When you be, when you know him as a, as a person, he's Rick. Yeah. Right. And then Freddie right. is his like stage name that he created yeah. really so he could have full creative freedom to things that he didn't do in his normal life. Like he was not that guy. I mean, he was very, very... Um, it, described as like we uh, should start we should start like a gofundme so we can get all these recordings on one cd or something i you know by the way i have the master tapes not of that not plastic oh fashion. by the way I'm gonna, i'll show i'm, I'm going to show pete might you know everybody else might oh i have that one too it. that's a compilation of a lot of it's a compilation remember this pete cool. LA Hits, yes i think it's called the it's crown called of LA. la i remember that and it was based on alien la LA in i remember that so these are the bands that are in it but here's the cats on the back here somewhere so all the bands are on the back and here where are they i know they're here I somewhere oh here they are incredible and they're That's right they're right there there they are oh, cool i don't know if you can read it but... yes i can't read it but it's really cool i see al and denny and pete and the song on the album is Can't Have You, right? Yeah, Can't Have You. That's a good one. First song on the album. I got to tell you something. I'm not going to play anything for you, but those songs are all fun to play. All of them. All of them. Yes. That's, That's what also I said. Like I and it's fun, man. It's fun. Like when you do, just like being at the show, it's fun. Yeah, that's what I mean about Rick. He was such an amazing songwriter that... The moment I saw the band, the, you know, the first night, it was like I was hooked. And like I said, I brought a friend of mine over today and I played two songs, Older Girls and Lost My TV Guy. And she's like, these guys are really good. I would have been a huge fan back in the day. And it's like, this is what, 40 years later? Right. I think my later. favorite song is Street Life. Really? Yeah. I don't think I know what your favorite song was. You want me to hear oh, it? You want to hear it? Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a great song. I mean, the... The breakdown in the middle with the guitar and, and saxophone. Let's hear it to wrap things up, you guys. <laughs> you can't really hear it too well. Yeah, you can find all this on Spotify. The yeah, you can hear it on Spotify. would be better. Can you hear it? No, we can't hear it too well. So just send the link on Spotify. Check it out on Spotify. And merch is on rumormerch.com if you want merch right. and whatnot. There's posters even from Jen Tusa, Dave, okay, and Skogi. Skogie people appreciate these stickers, maybe. Uh huh. Uh huh. And the songs are on. We got everybody I mean, covered. And the new cats uh, are on Spotify. There's a video that Mike Cohan, my brother-in-law's brother, made of his performance at Genghis Cohen, and there's a link to it that he put on this feed. Just so you know, if you guys want to watch it. And it was one of uh, my favorite songs, too, of his uh, later on. But um, it's called Wrong End of the Mississippi. And it's a really oh, good song. Oh, yeah. it's so funny. It's all about how he was born on, he, he wants to play the blues, but he was born in Minnesota. And what's a white guy to do in Minnesota when he wants he was to play born the blues? On the wrong end. Thing about Rick, so Rick good. Was, he was so prolific as a songwriter. They would always have, not always, but pretty much every few weeks or so, they would have new songs. <clears throat> and then they would change the set completely. It would be completely new songs that he would have. <clears throat> that the band would learn and i would miss some of those old songs not you know not too old but they would they wouldn't play some of the songs that they had already played you know for a while i'd be like can you play it you know it's it's a crime that's one of my all-time favorite songs so it's a crime you is know. one of yours yeah all-time favorite it's a song. crime yeah. yeah that's a good one i, I oh, listen yeah. to that one too kevin yeah well yeah. here's the site i'm gonna put in the chat the site for, that has all of his songs and you can stream any of them um he is on spotify and on itunes but this site right here, demophonic.com, is where he has a thousand songs, you guys. Like a thousand songs. It's 
his written, music publishing website, from like a but ditch yeah. laying in a ditch to like on top of a table. He's written songs everywhere about <laughs> his also life. Got, it also has bios music. and story. It has other stuff yeah. on there too. Right. He, he he did the site. Like that's this is what I'm saying. Like when you go to this site, you'll see how robust it is. And he did the whole thing. Like yep. so to see him not be able to work Skype and stuff like that's what I'm saying is like it was challenging. But yeah, yeah that's the site for that. The book is on Amazon, rumormerch.com for all this fun fun merch from the day and anything else we have you guys you so your favorite song let's all chime in with our favorite songs i love the one um i think it's the big one right so uh, yeah renee what says the rainbow yeah yes that's the yeah one. that's my favorite i always would ask him to play it every time i saw him renee i have a lot of favorites though i, I love leave me alone too that's a good one oh yeah yeah and Kevin, there's just there's just so many little. there was just yeah there was just so many that it's and I, don't, I don't have a, I don't have a favorite. Power. I have many. I have many favorites. I don't have one. Right. Yeah, me too. TV Guide from Harlan. Everybody shout out their favorite song if you have one. Oh, that's what the that's the show. It was the 999 show that Denny picked somebody with a bass. That's right. Does anyone Stephen, remember? Stephen Young just remember? I knew it was there the was a bass hitting show. situation. Bass yeah. Oh yes. yeah. Because 999, I don't know if you guys remember, but 999 was a punk band, pretty much, you know. Yeah, that's what I was talking about, that OC yeah. club. I forgot what the club, yeah. uh, Cuckoo's Nest, Cuckoo's Nest. Yes, that's, what it was that's it, that's right. Oh. Orange County. Nice one. Show a little emotion. Show a little motion is the that's Pat right. Boone's favorite song. Pat Boone's favorite song. Show a little that song, played on that. It, there it was, played I can't remember that. the song he would play. They would play the song before that, which was a ballad, which I can't remember. Can you use me? May have been World All Alone or something like that, but then World when they would alone. launch, but they wouldn't, they would launch to show it, show a little emotion. Oh, right, the place would just go crazy. The place would go crazy. Too. Yeah. Well, it was, that was his, such a it, rock was, it was his tribute to Elvis, wasn't it? Yeah, it was such I a rockin' song. Yeah, it just yeah. blew the place apart because that was that was the finale of the of the right. The yeah. Call me crazy, Wingo from Skokie Days. It's not so a rumor. good. Glenn it's a crime. Not yes, a rumor. It's, it's a, not a rumor. It's classic. Yeah, yeah, Pete, it's a crime. It's one of the greatest songs of all time. It's a crime. That's, that's the one. Pat Boone could never be another. That's Ooh. the one. Uh, wait a minute. He also had another song. Love song. It's called Our Love Song. That song makes me cry. He had, oh another, he had a great, I, he had another I great ironic song called Oh My I God, it's free. so heartfelt. Do you remember, Renee, remember the song, I Want to Be Free, Hold Me? I want to be free, hold me. Yeah. Right. It was such, it was yep. so ironic. It was such, you know, it's like, I want to be free. It was free. good. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Treat me like dirt. Eric <laughs> likes the scene. I like oh, the first, the first Mar likes to treat me like, like dirt. Woman. And the first, the first, the first Skokie songs I ever heard was The Butler Did It and I'm Not the One or something. Like I that. like Pretend That You Love Me. Is that a Skokie song? I don't remember that one. I Fourth of July Woman did. is my favorite from Skokie. That's my favorite from Skokie. Oh, nice. Yeah, okay. that's uh, that's Lucy's song. That's Lucy's song. I don't yeah. know if Lucy's here. I invited her earlier today. She's amazing. Yeah. Any other favorite songs? Oh, All of them. them. All of them. Yeah, <laughs> we got a, there's 104 people still on. That's great. Wow, wow. you stuck people? with us this whole time, just gushing about Rick. Combat zone. <laughs> Combat zone. That's a good one. Combat yeah. zone. Yeah. Roseanne yeah, that's, that's, loved that one. Yeah, that's on. That's on this EP. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. It's a good, you know, you could rock out to these things still. Pretend you love me. I love that. Pretend that you love me. Busy Body was always a big hit, too. Busy mm. Body was a good one and very true. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> no, no comment. Very true. Yes. No comment. We won't talk about that. I'm true and trusted. That's That's the difference. Yeah. Oh, true and trusted companion. Oh yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Oh California, come over here and come. Oh yeah, California. Oh, right. Heather loves California. Heather, I love you. Here I come. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. California, here I come. Yeah. We used to dress up to look older, to look so we could look sixteen to get in. <laughs> <laughs> we were thirteen he's, he's, and we were Rick, trying to Rick dress up like thirteen. Well, Rick got me into Holy. a couple of like twenty-one and over places a few times. You know. He's like, just well, sit over there in the corner. Don't, don't, don't make any wave. Don't go to the bar. Don't anything. Just sit over there. I'll tell you a secret, but I'm not supposed to. But I stole my sis, my older sister's birth certificate. Went to the DMV and got a California ID with her birth date and my face on it, and I could get in anywhere. 
<laughs> That's how I bought the Jack Daniels. <laughs> Uh, Stephen Young is bringing up the, the Keystone Berkeley and Palo Alto shows. I was there for those. I went up with uh, Rick and I drove up in my car. Wow. To go up there. Yeah, they were great. It was great. We spent the weekend with his cousins, I think, or Demi's cousins or something. Anyway. But yeah, it was great. Palo Alto and Berkeley Aww, were great. Stephanie. <laughs> and Debbie says, knowing him as a person, not a persona, he's soft spoken and shy. He's amazing. Mm -hmm. he Absolutely. Is. Nice. You never Debbie. expect. Very nice. Just kind he and was. He, he still is. He's super gentle. Even now. He doesn't get mad or anything. Yeah. He's really cute. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, I can't remember him ever getting mad about anything, really. I mean, not, you know, not outwardly, you know, mad or anything like that. He just right. always seemed to have this even keel yeah. about him all the time, it seemed like, you know. Well, he was super... Um, dependable and like you could trust him no matter what and that's that says something you know i learned a lot from him i'm i wouldn't be this person at all if without him i i swear i wouldn't i wouldn't be this at all uh, i wouldn't be who i am him. what he's what? asking is there any secrets that were left out of the book oh uh, yeah uh yeah <laughs> we don't want to we cannot say well, there was that night Rick and I went to Vegas. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. What stays in Vegas happens in Vegas. What? I don't know. There's a lot we kept out, right, Shannon? There is, but there's a lot we put in. So read it. It's good. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good read. I mean, it's not a skinny book by any means. It's a, you know, it's a, you know, you can't really do everybody anybody's life story, you know, all in one. Time, but this is this book this has fantastic. So much I mean, I've read it a couple it. of times. I've already read it a couple of times. It has so much. I mean, there's so much. It's so many things. The love story, LA, the bands, the music, the songwriting, the famous ex, and uh, not so much. Uh the <laughs> the, the, okay, the hey, just the about, fun. What about the famous people that love? I mean, Rick, you know, Sting, Gene Simmons, I mean, you know, all these. These celebrities. Yeah. We just lost, I think we lost Shannon. I'm oh, here. Yeah, Shannon. I, was, Where'd you go? I was frozen. I was frozen okay. for a second. Okay. But yeah, there yes. was I remember I remember oh, I was I remember you. one time. I remember the time when Gene Simmons was Rick was talking to Gene Simmons on the phone. And then Gene Simmons tells Freddie, there's somebody I want you to talk to. And Freddie's like, he wants he's putting somebody on the phone. He starts talking to somebody. And it turns out to be Diana Ross. What? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Somehow Gene Simmons was hanging out with Diana Ross and she put he put her on the phone to talk to Freddie because he was telling Gene Simmons was telling Diana about how great once. Freddie was. She's lovely, a lovely woman. I met her once. Oh yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, she her daughter opened us a store on Ventura Boulevard. I went to I went to the opening. Nice. Anyways, we but got he was gushing it up. about Freddie to, to her. And we love that everybody was here. Hundred and four so people. Being with for us here. Here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, everyone. This was like the greatest project of my life. I love it. Thank you so much. Thanks, thank everybody. you for doing it, Shannon. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Alexandra. Don't forget to buy thank your you book. Thank everyone here. I mean, all the Thank you so much, all of you, for such support. And it's going to be recorded, so. Rick um, would be super proud of this book. I'm telling you, I know he would. He would be really proud of it. So everyone can go back to the same link and watch the recording. Um, buy the book, and thanks for coming and supporting, guys. So have a great night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.